Dale Church. We're so happy that you are here. Um, I'm going to invite you guys to stand as we go into a time of worship. Um, the sun is shining. I got a reason to praise. Would you sing along with me?
regardless of what circumstance you're going through right now, we have reached to worship a God who's willing to die on a cross in our place. And so when you walked into the auditorium this morning, uh, you received the elements for communion. And this is specifically for those of you who are followers of Jesus. And it's a moment where we get to remember and reflect on the power of the gospel. Because we cannot advance the gospel both here, near, and far if we don't first take time to recognize the impact that it has on our life today. And so I want to, before we do this, I want to, us to reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He says, but, but we have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. And as you hold the, the bread in your hand, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus had to die a physical and historical death that you're missing. And so this was his body given for you and for me. And not only did he give his body, but, but I want you to reflect on any of the sin in your life that has put him on the cross. Like that is what he died for today. He died for your sin today. Your past, your present, your future sin, all of that. And so take a moment to just confess that sin to him. And, and, and before we, we drink the cup, let us reflect on the second half of what Paul has to say to us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He says, but it is the gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the scripture tells us that the blood is not only a, uh, is a symbol of our life, for life is found in the blood. Not just that he shed his life, but he did so that we may have life. So would you take this in remembrance? Let me pray as we continue in worship. Jesus, I thank you for the transformative power of the gospel. I thank you that you loved us enough to die on a cross and to rise again from the dead that we might have life with you for all of eternity. And as much as you want the other people in this world to experience that, as much as you want the power of the gospel to reach the least and the lost, you want it to reach us here this morning. So I pray that we would worship you, that we reflect on that, and that we'd be grateful for the power of the gospel. Feel free to remain standing if you would like to or however the Lord leads you to worship during this time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see t'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious Precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who calls me here below will be Good morning, everyone. It is a joy to worship God with you all this morning. If we haven't met before, my name is John Odom, and I have the privilege of serving as our campus pastor at the U of M. Uh, and so I am truly excited to be here worshiping the Lord with you this morning. If uh, you guys can be take a moment and be seated, sorry. Um, if you wouldn't mind, we would love to know that you all are here. And so there's a connection card in the pew back of the seat in front of you. If you wouldn't mind just filling that out, we would really appreciate it. If it's your first time here, again, we would love to connect with you and to welcome you and to just share the love of Jesus with you this morning. So uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking that uh, out to the Next Steps area where we can greet you and um, build a relationship with you, that would be awesome. Here at Wooddale, one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is because we value advancing the gospel here, near, and far. And so one of the ways in which we're doing that near is through the new campus that I have the opportunity of helping lead at the U of M. It will be called the avenue. And so over the last couple of months, I've had uh, just recruiting sessions to try to um, get people to come alongside me because the reality is the great commission to go and to advance the kingdom of God was not meant to be something that's done in isolation, but it's meant to be done as the body of Christ. And so some of you have been showing up to those and today is the last one uh, that I'm going to be having. It's at noon. If you have time, I would love for you to join me if you feel uh, led to be a part of what God is doing. Because here's the reality. God is doing something amazing at the U of M. And he wants us to be a part of it. You know, I, we have the opportunity to see hundreds, perhaps even thousands of college students come to know and to love Jesus for who he is. And to worship him for all of their life. Not only here on earth, but for all of eternity. And, and like that's the end goal is that they might know him and love him and worship him and that we might make disciples of each and every generation. And I just want you all to know that God is already doing amazing things. We have three events this week uh, to try and reach these students, to build relationships with them. And my schedule is filling up more and more and more with students. And it's so fun to be a part of their lives and to be in their lives. And they are so hungry for truth. They are so hungry for the gospel. They are so hungry for the joy and satisfaction that can only be found in Jesus. And so if you guys wouldn't mind just praying with me over these events this upcoming week and even over the summer, uh, it's potential, I have a potential opportunity to lead a Bible study with some of the football players. And so God is doing amazing things. But here's the reality. I need the body of Christ to help be the body of Christ. I can't do it on my own. And so if you want to be a part of that, I would love uh, to meet with you and to connect with you. And if you've given to Wooddale in the last year, you are a part of what God is already doing at the U of M. And for, so for that, I'm, I'm seriously grateful. And, and more than that, God delights in your generosity. So thank you. And as we prepare to receive the offering, uh, let me just pray before we continue on in worship. Jesus, I just thank you so much for the power of the gospel and that you have a desire to reach those at the U and even here at this campus, God, that you want us to grow in our relationship with you. And that only happens through the power of the cross. And so I pray that you would reveal to us the impact of the cross on our life today. And that you would use the offering, that you use the tithe, that you use our entire life, not just our finances, to exalt your kingdom and your power and your glory for every age to come. In your name I pray.
Don't make me come back there. Oh, that makes me anxious. Just watching that. Uh, when Seth and I first got married, we were just starting out. We had graduated from college. I was getting ready to go into graduate school, and we just didn't have a lot financially. So to help us out, my parents gifted us their used couch. And uh, when we went over to pick up the couch, we were actually really happy with it. It was much nicer than anything we would have been able to afford. Uh, but as we uh, carried it off uh, to, uh, to, to the trailer, we realized why they were so quick to get rid of this thing. Uh, it was heavy, like really heavy. It was one of these hide beds So there's like a bed in the couch. And uh, we, we actually... Uh, moved this couch uh, a, a lot. We uh, moved it from house to house, which just kind of proves I'm cheaper than I am smart uh, in terms of, of moving it. But wherever we had it, we had to be really strategic with where it was placed. Because it was so heavy, there was like no way this thing was going to get up or down a staircase. And so you could say that the weight of the sofa determined its place in our lives. And that same principle is something that God wants to teach us in his word today. That there's a weightiness with something that will determine its proper place in our lives. And if we can understand what that principle is and put it into practice, then God's promise to us is that our lives will be better for it. And for those of us that are raising children, if our kids we'll put that principle into practice, that they will live a life that is more honoring to God. That principle comes to us in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open up to Ephesians chapter 6. If you want to use one of the blue Bibles we provide for you, it's on page 1781. And uh, as you're turning there, I just want to welcome everybody online. Good to have you with us. Hope you can open a Bible and uh, join us in the scriptures as well. Uh, So Ephesians chapter 6, and this is the word of the Lord that comes to first that church in Ephesus through the apostle Paul. Ephesians 6, 1, it says this. Children, let's actually stop right there. Okay, the apostle Paul is writing to a, a specific group of people. Uh, to to this church that has started in Ephesus. And he's writing this letter in mind with with what's going on spiritually with this church. He also recognizes that this is probably going to become a circular letter that's going to be passed around from church to church all throughout the known world. So Paul has this in mind when he's writing. And when the Apostle Paul or some of the other apostles were writing these letters, they would get them together, they'd write them down, and then they would hand them to a messenger. That messenger would go to the church and they would gather the church together. And then once the church was gathered together, it's, it's there, they'd read it. Now, they didn't get together in buildings like this with all this uh, with, with pews and, and, and formal place. They gathered in people's homes, right? So this would be like, um, Tom, we'd be like going to your house, right? We, we, you know, like we'd all gather together. Uh, Brenda would cook for us, right? <laughs> not, not you. Uh, but Brenda would cook for us, and we'd all get together. And then after the meal, somebody would stand up and say, okay, now here's the word that, that Paul has, has for us as this church. So everybody would be there. So when Paul writes this, he's inspired by the Holy, scripture, the Holy Spirit as he write these, writes these scriptures. It's not just him making this up. But he's very specific about what he's writing. Every word matters in here. So let me, let me ask this question. Ephesians 6, 1 Who is Paul addressing? He's addressing who? Children. He's addressing children. Okay, why is he addressing children? The the reason I ask that is because in this culture, when you wanted to address something that was going on in the home, which is what Paul's doing in this whole passage, this, this whole entire section, you would begin by addressing the head of the household. You would actually go to fathers, and you would say, okay, here's what households need to do, so fathers, here's how you need to parent your children. And now, he gets into fathers here in a few verses, that's what Pastor Dale spoke on last week, but, but for this passage here, he starts by saying children, that's on purpose, why does he do that? When we get to the end of our time together today, we understand the principle that Paul's teaching us. We're going to understand why he addresses children specifically. Okay, so now now we can like go on to the whole rest of verse 1. Okay, so children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is 
right. Paul's going to give us three principles here today when it comes to parenting, and this is the first one. The first is that when it comes to parenting, we are to teach our children how to live rightly. That there is a right way for people to live, and parents, it's our obligation to make sure that our children know the right way to live, to live rightly. Now, the argument that Paul is making is that there's kind of a universal way to live, that there is a right way to live. He's actually not making a theological argument. He's not teaching us about the nature and the character of God at this point. He's just saying there's a right way to live, and it's for kids to obey their parents, which is kind of an interesting and universal argument. I mean, there wasn't in Paul's day, and there still really isn't to this day, a worldview or a religion that teaches kids that it's morally, morally permissible, that it's actually the right thing to do to disobey your parents. That, that doesn't really exist. And the reason it doesn't exist is because of kind of what parenting is all about. By definition, as parents, you know more than your children. And our obligation is to make sure that our kids grow up to be functioning adults in society. We want to help them survive childhood. And so there's just a lot of instruction that we have to give them because they just don't know any better. I mean, just things like don't play with fire and don't run out in the street. I mean, just, just simple things to help keep them alive. But the reason that Paul spends time talking about it is because you and I have to learn obedience. It doesn't come natural to us. In fact, Scripture is really clear that we have to learn obedience because God's big story begins in a book that we've spent a lot of time in here at Wooddale recently, Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 3, we have this image that's set up of kind of a family type of a relationship. You have God, our heavenly father, who has some children. And he gives some really specific instruction to the, the kids. He says, okay, here's the deal. This is the garden. Here's uh, all, of, all of these trees, and they have some great fruit. And you can eat from any of them. Just have at it. Like as much as you want, any of these, go for it. Just in this whole garden, just this one right here, just this tree, this one's mine. Don't eat from it. It's bad for you. Okay, all of the other ones are good. This one's bad, right? Yes, no. Okay, got it? Go, right? And then the next thing that happens is Adam and Eve, what do they do? They eat the fruit from these trees? This one? Yeah, if you said this one, you know the story or you have children right? <laughs> because we just naturally are disobedient. That's true in my own life. I am naturally disobedient. I don't like following direction about things that don't make sense to me. Our neighborhood is uh, off Mitchell Road here in Eden Prairie, and the speed limit on Mitchell Road is painfully slow. And every time, this morning, driving to church, every morning, I'm like, I have to fight to drive the speed limit. Now here's the, I know somebody smarter than I am has done some research and they've figured out that this is what the speed limit needs to be on this road. And I think that it's a good thing for people to follow the speed limit. In fact, I think when you drive on Mitchell Road, you should drive the speed limit. <laughs> but when I drive on it, I want to drive the speed that I want to drive. That's just natural for us. We have to learn obedience. It doesn't come natural to us. So if you are raising children or you have grandkids, you need to teach them to obey you because otherwise they will not learn it. It doesn't come natural to us. Now, now that actually raises a question that, that some folks will ask theologically. Uh, they'll say, well, what do we do in situations where parents are telling children to do something that's a violation of God's law or God's word? What, what do you do then? And Paul almost anticipates that question with how he phrases this. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. So he's already saying that there's a hierarchy here, that we have to obey God first and foremost, and if your parents ever give you some instruction that you're supposed to do that violates God's law, you need to honor God first and foremost. But if you're ever in that situation, first of all, that, that's a very unfair situation to be in. And if you ever find yourself in that situation, get the advice of a pastor or, or some spiritual mentor in your life, because uh, th that is a very difficult thing to try to figure out, how do I, how do I navigate that? Because while there may be a couple exceptions here and there, the larger principle remains we need to learn obedience. Now, that will help as we raise children for them to become functioning adults in society. But that's not really our vision. 
Right? Our vision isn't just that we raise kids that are functioning adults in society. Our vision is that the next generation is going to become people who are followers of Jesus, resilient, faithful followers of Jesus. And in order for that to happen, we need something more than just obedience. We need to teach them honor. And that's why Paul goes on to verse 2. He writes this, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy a long life on the earth. So the second principle that Paul gives to us is when it comes to parenting, we need to teach our children to live respectfully. That's what honor is all about, to respect other people, to honor uh, our, our father and our mother. And when Paul is quoting here, uh, honor your father and mother, he's quoting from the Old Testament and specifically from the Ten Commandments. Now those were originally given to God's people in the Hebrew language. And in the Ten Commandments, the word honor, for honor your father and mother, that word in Hebrew means weighty. So a, a, a more literal translation of that commandment would be this, consider the weightiness of your mother and father. Or treat your mother and father with the weight that they deserve. It actually helps us understand more of what it means to honor, and it brings us back to this couch. So in a way, you could say that Stephanie and I, that, that we honored this couch when we selected where it would live in our home. Because we, we gave respect to the weight of the couch. And because of its weight, we determined its placement in our lives. That, that's true when it comes to the relationship we have with our parents. That we need to consider the weight that that relationship has in terms of how we treat them and how we behave and interact toward them. The challenge with that is that's not naturally how we do relationships. Naturally, it's how I do relationships is I tend to be reciprocal in relationships. And oftentimes, I'm self-referential in that. So what I mean by that is that I'll, I'll treat you based on how you've treated me. So if, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. If you're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. If you're mean to me, I'm going to be mean to you. Or in Minnesota culture, I'll be passive aggressive towards you. <laughs> or I'm going to create some distance from you because I don't want you to be mean to me. But the self-referential part is that it's not from an objective place that I make that determination. It's how I feel you've treated me. So if I feel that you've been unkind to me, I'm going to treat you in that response. That's, that's the self-referential part. But here's the challenge. When it, when it comes to understanding and valuing the weight of relationships, we cannot be self-referential on it. What I, what I mean by that is if I were to tell you that this couch just didn't weigh anything, things super light, and I would treat it like it was super light. If I, if I said, oh, I, can, I can carry this by myself, and I was going to bend over with my back, not my legs, and just lift it with one hand, you would, you would say, don't do that. You're going to get yourself hurt. And I probably would hurt myself because I didn't give respect to its weight. There are a number of people who are hurting emotionally and who are hurting spiritually because they have not given the proper weight to the role of their mom and their dad in their lives. That's what it means for us to honor that relationship. So how do we do that? Practically speaking, how do we honor our mother and our father? Well, a lot of it is, is based on the different seasons we have of our life. So uh, for those of you that are still living in the home, uh, which is the reason that the sofa is on this side of the stage, <laughs> Uh, is because um, when we're living in the home, there are certain ways that we honor our mother and our father. One of the primary ways that we honor mom and dad is that we honor them by doing what we said the first principle is, we have to obey them. We have to obey their instructions. Uh, but, but it has to go more than just obedience. We have to move from just thinking about honoring our parents being actions, and it's much more about attitude. And the reason for that is because this relationship with mom and dad has weight, because if, if we're not for them, we wouldn't exist. Which is true for all of us, by the way. All of us sit uh, on the shoulders of our parents, so to speak. We exist because of our parents. 
And so we have to give weight to that relationship. We honor that. And so when you're in the home, you do it by, by treating mom and dad as if the way you're behaving toward them pays attention to, to that relationship and the significance of, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. Growing up, I never got into trouble, almost never, uh, for uh, disobeying my parents. And that's mainly because I never got caught. <laughs> I got into trouble all the time for not honoring them. In particular, my mom. When I was in middle school, I gave my mom the hardest time. I was like a brat to her. I would challenge her authority. I would do what she told me to do, but I would tell her there was a better way to do it. I would question why she was asking me to do it. I would question when she was asking me to do it. I just made life really difficult for my mom. And my dad was traveling a lot for work during this season of our life, and it, it was very common for him to come home. In fact, I remember one time I had made mom cry, and, and dad finally came home from his trip, and he heard about it, and he had just had enough. And, and to his credit, he didn't yell, and he, and he wasn't inappropriate, uh, but he got real quiet, and he assigned me a research project. So he said, here's what you need to do, Kyle. He said, I need you to write a paper on the biblical reason that God calls you to honor your mom. And I had to cite scripture in the paper. Then the man proofread it and made me read it out loud to my mom. So if you're a parent, use that one. <laughs> it's effective. Parents, we, we, we have to insist that our kids learn to honor us. So, so if you're living in the home, the question you need to be asking yourself is every time you react to your parents, do you have a conversation with them, how you treat them? I, am, I, am I respecting the weight of, of my parents by what I'm doing? So listen, if, if your mom sends you a text message, text her back. She carried you for nine months, right? <laughs> she adopted you. She chose you. Like, you need to treat your parents with respect. Okay, so now what do we do for those of us that aren't living in the home anymore? There, there are many of us that have, have gone on to our lives and we're creating our own world, or our, own, our own families. Uh, well, how do we show honor and respect to our mom and dad? Well, we still need to come back sometimes. So we still need to choose to, to have our mom and dad be actively involved in our lives, which means we, we might need to bring our kids and, and bring our kids and say, hey, in this family, we honor mom and dad. Uh, we honor grandma and grandpa. If you want to teach your kids to honor you, then one of the great ways you can do that is to model for them how you honor your own parents. It's really hard to expect our kids are going to honor us if they hear us complain about their grandparents all the time. All right, so, so we need to model this, and if you, if you have kids and your parents are still alive, they need to have access to their grandkids. It's so honoring when you choose to give that time for them. And there, and there are some of you who, who you're kind of beyond that stage in life, and you're in the stage of life where you're now taking care of your parents. And they're nearing the end of their life. And you're having to do this odd ro role reversal where you're now the parent, you're now making decisions for them. And I just want to say, if you're in that season of life, you taking care of them is one of the most effective and powerful ways for you to honor them. And I want you to know that God sees the sacrifice that you're making. And it's very honoring to them. Now for some, right about now, this is really difficult. And it's really difficult because the relationship between you and your parents is pretty strained. There's a lot of distance in that relationship. There's been some conflict in that relationship. And the question is, if that's true for you, how do you show respect and honor to your mom and dad when, when there's distance or there's conflict between you and your, and your folks? And there's a few real practical ways that we can do that. The first way you can do that is just by turning toward your parents. It, it's doing everything in your power to try to move toward a place of healing and reconciliation, as much as it depends on you. But you don't have to do it alone. You would never move a couch by yourself. You'd have somebody help you. So talk with a pastor. Find somebody who's a little bit ahead on their spiritual journey to, to talk with you about uh, how do you do this. Seek out a Christian counselor or therapist to give you wise instruction about how you can properly try to, to work on, on that relationship with mom and dad. And as you do, as you're, as you're trying to move back toward your parents, 
if one of the reasons that there's distance and conflict is because there's been some deep unhealth on the part of your parents, it's still honoring to mom and dad to have boundaries in place. I, I know someone who has a really difficult relationship with with their parents, and what, what they've chosen to do is they just said, listen, um, mom and dad, you, you've really struggled with alcohol, and so the deal is, is like, when you've been drinking, we're just not going to come over, because it never goes well. In fact, when you've been drinking, you're just not allowed to talk with our kids, even on the phone. That's a boundary that we're putting in place. That's still a way to honor them and try to move toward reconciling that relationship. And, and for some of us, Maybe our parents are no longer living. And the relationship wasn't great. So how do you honor that? One of the most powerful things, whether your parents are, are, are still with us or, or if they're not, one of the most powerful ways that we can honor them is, is to forgive them. You know, someone doesn't have to ask for forgiveness in order for us to offer it. And even if your folks are no longer living, you choosing to forgive them is a wonderful step to honor them and honor their memory and to make sure that there's not going to become a root of bitterness that grows up in your life. Now, for some of us, you're the parent. You're on this side of that conflict. And, and I would just say, if that's true for you, then all three of those things, moving toward having appropriate boundaries and seeking forgiveness, all three of those things apply to you. And you can actually model for your, your kids who are estranged how to honor you by you choosing to honor them. And all of this, honestly, it sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? I mean, there's a lot of effort, a lot of energy that goes in. This is emotional. And the reason is because it, it weighs so much. But, but maybe, maybe the most important question is for us to ask why. Why is this so important for us to, to honor our, our parents? And the, and the reason for it is because of the third principle that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us here. And it's that we need to teach our kids how to live reverently. See, all of this parenting business isn't really actually about us. The reason we teach our kids to obey us isn't because we're so worthy of obedience. The reason we teach our kids to obey us is so they'll learn how to obey God. The reason we insist that, that our kids honor us isn't because we're so worthy of honor. It's so that they will learn how to honor God. That we need to teach our kids how to live reverently for God. And Paul kind of hints at this with, with something he does in this passage of Scripture. He quotes for us the Ten Commandments but he changes one of the words. It's very strange. Let, let, me, let me point it out to you. Uh, the Ten Commandments come to us in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And, and here's uh, what the Lord said to the people of Israel and, and to us. Honor your father and mother so that you may, and here it is, live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses is kind of recapping for people the law right before they move into the promised land. This is kind of like one last pep talk before they go into this land that God has, has given to them. And he reminds them of, of all of the, the things of the law, including the Ten Commandments. So in Deuteronomy 5, Moses says, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you. He's reminding them. And then he quotes it again, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. So the promise is specific to the land of Israel, that if you honor your father and mother, God is going to allow you to spend and live a long time in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. And the reason for that is because God's plan was that the people would move into that promised land and that they would follow him, and that, that he would be their God, they would be his people, and because they followed him, he would bless them enormously, that things would go well for them, that other nations would be so impressed. They, they would be like, have you heard what's happening in Israel? Like, they pray and their God shows up. Like, have you seen their harvest? It's amazing. It's like God's hand is with them. Have you seen their wealth? Have you seen how well their society is? Like, it would be so impressive to the people because they followed God and God was with them. This was the plan. Now, it never happened that way because the people didn't keep the law. But that was the, that was the promise. 
So, so we, we get to this point now in, in Ephesians 6 where Paul, who was a Pharisee, who knew the Old Testament inside and out, he had it memorized, and he quotes to us the commandment, but he changes it. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So he's saying the promise still remains, but listen to the wording change, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Why did he change it? See, Paul's inspired by the Holy Spirit here. He changes it because the scope is different, but the promise remains. Paul understands that now in Jesus, it's not just about the specific land in Israel. That's not what we're limited to. That, that Jesus has said, go and make disciples of all nations. That this becomes a global movement, and, and Paul's recognizing that, so he updates the language to fit the call that Jesus has given to us, but the promise remains. What was the promise? What's this principle all about? Well, right as Moses had gathered the people together and he was about ready to recite for them the Ten Commandments, he, he said to them, he said, now listen, when you move into this land, I know what's going to happen. You're going to get really busy. You're going to get really busy setting up your businesses. You're going to get really busy setting up your farms and your homes. You're going to get distracted. Don't let that happen. As you go about setting up your lives, focus on God so that it may go well with you. Don't forget and then he tells them how to make sure that as a society, they will not forget the Lord. Here it is in Deuteronomy 4, 9. Moses says this, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. And here's the instruction. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. That's the plan. All of this works if just mom and dad you teach this to your kids, and then make sure that they teach it to their kids. That's always been God's plan. That his people will be able to prosper here on the earth if one generation teaches the next about how to live reverently for God. That's what parenting is ultimately about. That's why we say our kids need to obey us. So they'll learn how to obey God. It's, it's why they need to honor us, so they'll learn how to honor God. Just a few weeks ago, I was on the phone with uh, a pastor that I know. He, he lives in a, states, uh, a, a couple states down south. And uh, we were on the phone. We were planning a service together. And uh, kind of halfway through the conversation, he, he interrupted me. and said, hey, sorry. I, I, he said, I'm, I'm here at home. I have to deal with something real quick. Just, just hold on a minute. And then in the background, I hear this. He, he says to his son, he says, son, you can't throw dirt into our home. <laughs> and I like in instant mental image, right? Like what's, what's going on here? Uh, and and, and uh, I start laughing and I'm kind of like, what's going on in this house? And, and it's almost immediate response. Like as soon as he says it, like right away, there's this precious little voice with a slight southern draw that responds to him and says, I'm sorry, daddy, I won't throw how or dirt into our house anymore. I was like, man, that is the voice of a child that is learning how to honor and obey his dad. And then I thought, you know, I, I know his dad. His dad loves Jesus. That's the voice of a child that is learning how to honor and obey his heavenly father. And it's so important because here's the reality. At some point in every one of our lives, we throw dirt into God's house. By how we treat other people, by being self-centered, by giving in to gossip. And if we've learned to become obedient and to learn how to honor those who have gone before us, that prepares us to be more sensitive to the voice of God who in a gentle but firm way will say, hey, don't throw dirt into my house. And we'll say, Abba, Father, I'm so sorry. I won't do that anymore. That's why the Apostle Paul begins this passage of Scripture by talking to children. Because if the plan is that kids are going to learn how to be reverent to God from their families, then Paul's expectation is when the church gathers together, 
the families will bring their children. Paul expects that when this letter is read, kids are going to be in the room. That's why he addresses it to children. Because the expectation is, is that if our kids are going to understand how important God is in our lives, they need to be present with us in church. It's one of the ways that we show them that we honor God. See, the reality is, is, that, is that God has weight in our lives. And we have to make sure that we are showing honor to him and giving him the honor that he deserves for the weightiness of him in our lives. If it were not for God, you and I would not exist. If it were not for God, you and I would not have the salvation that we have, the freedom from sin, the fact that we're going to have life everlasting. God is the one who's provided all of that, and we need to show honor to who God is by showing up on a regular basis to worship him. Because that's what we do when the church gathers. This isn't Christian entertainment, and it's not just Christian education. This is worship. It's where we come in and we recognize, God, you have significant weight in our lives, and we're going to give you some time and attention because you deserve it. And moms and dads, we are obligated to teach that to our children so they will teach it to theirs. Which means we have to have kids with us when we come to church. And we have to be here on a regular basis to let them know this matters. Sometimes parents will tell me, they're like, well, yeah, but here's the deal, Kyle. Like, my kids are in, in Christian school, so like they're getting all the, all the Bible education they need, so they're going to be okay. And, and I'll tell them, hey, that's great, good for you. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. That is good for your kids. But listen, that's not what it's only about. It's not just about knowledge, it's about being part of a community that worships God. And on a regular basis, we need to carve time aside to come in and as a multiple generations gathering together and worshiping God. Because when we get together, that's what we're doing here. Other parents will tell me, they're like, well, yeah, but like, here's the deal, like, my, my kids think church is boring. And I'm like, so is algebra. <laughs> but you don't pull your kids out of algebra class because they're bored. You know they need it. It's good parenting to have them there. And I just have to say this. If, we, if our kids think the church is boring, they don't understand what's going on here. And if they don't understand what's going on here, maybe it's because we haven't explained to them what's going on here. And if we think church is boring, maybe we don't understand what's going on here. Because we have come in to worship God who has the most significant weight in our lives. I think that's worth an hour a week. And when we worship, here's what happens. It's not like we, we, we come in to worship God and, and we worship him and he stands off at a distance and kind of gives us a golf clap and then see you next week. When we come in to worship God, here's what happens. We come in to worship God and God says, I'm so glad you're here. Okay, okay, come here, come here. I, I want to tell, tell you more about me. Come, come here, I, I want to tell you some stories of things that I've done to bring hope and healing to people. Hey, come here, come here. I, I want to tell you what is true about you. I want to tell you how deeply I love you and how much I long for you and how much you are worth to me. Come, spend some time with me. Thanks for honoring me with your presence. Folks, that's not boring. That's life-changing. We teach our kids. <laughs> if you're clapping, you need to be here next week. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we teach our kids to live rightly so that they'll live respectfully. And we teach our kids to live respectfully so that they will learn to live reverently. And if we teach our kids to live reverently, they will grow to be resilient followers of Jesus Christ. That's what parenting is all about. Father God, we're grateful for your word. Father, we're grateful for your presence in our lives. Lord, we, we pause right now with the weight of your presence here. And Lord, I, I pray in particular 
for the parents who have a difficult and challenged relationship with their children. Father, I pray for children right now who have a a difficult and challenged relationship with their parents, regardless of how old they may be. Father, I invite your Holy Spirit to speak to and, and to help to bring healing and wisdom and restoration to those who have some challenged relationships within their family. Father, teach us how we can honor one another so ultimately we can honor you. Father, thank you that we don't do this alone, but your promise is that you will give us your spirit to do this with us. We pray all of this in the powerful and the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand as we close out our service today. As you're doing that, I do want to encourage you to be back next week because next week we are celebrating baptisms. And baptisms is an opportunity for us to be reminded of the new life that we have because of Jesus Christ. And it is a wonderful moment for the church to get together in celebration of that new life. Now, as you go from this place, find opportunities to honor those who have gone before you so that it may go well with you and you may live a long life here on the earth. God bless you as you go.